At our clinic at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco, we frequently use water fasting to help patients get a jump start on a healthy way to eat as well as it's such an effective tool in lowering high blood pressure, clearing out diabetes, cooling off arthritic joints, quelling inflammations of all sorts. We see psoriasis clear uh, quickly on fast and migraine headaches gets better, get better, asthma gets better. It's such a powerful modality uh, to help gain control over these very, very serious symptoms that many people have. However, as we make clear to our patients, and I'd like to make clear to everyone watching, uh, as powerful as a water fast is to gain control over these troublesome symptoms, the most important thing that far overrides the water fast is what you eat after the fast. Uh, these conditions in Western societies are created largely uh, by the animal-based, meat and dairy-based uh, standard Western diet filled with hydrogenated oils and refined sugars and, uh, and animal products. And this toxic brew that flows through our tissues, inflames our arteries, uh, makes us obese, uh, gives us diabetes, etc. And though the water fast can help control the symptoms, if the person gets through a fast, even a long one, and then goes back to chicken and cheese and olive oil, and oh, the symptoms come back within days. It's shocking how quickly Cinderella turns back into a pumpkin. And so during the water fast, uh, and any people who stay at True North, uh, we send them to cooking classes. We give them food demonstrations. We want them to watch the nutrition videos. And no, it's not cruel and unusual punishment to go to a cooking class while you're on a water fast. The uh, people aren't hungry during a fast and they really don't mind that. But the most important thing is to learn how to make a whole food plant-based diet at home or at least uh, make one happen if you're not cooking it yourself and keep the beneficial changes that start during the water fast, keep it going through your life and you'll get so healthy you don't need to come back and do another water fast. So the water fast is a tool, it's not a be all and end all of itself. Most important thing is the food that you run through your system day after day, week after week, month after month. That's what creates a body that's either lean and healthy with normal blood pressure and no need to see doctors or one that's all obese and clogged up and inflamed and uh, has lots of uh, diagnoses attached to it. So as the plaque in my office says, it's the food, it's the food, it's the food. So uh, it's not so much the fast, it's the food, but fasting can be a very helpful tool to uh, help people get that initial jump start towards lasting health. If a person is basically healthy, they're not taking any medications, they're not seeing a physician on a regular basis for any chronic disease, uh, they have normal function of their liver, kidneys, etc. Uh, then yes, uh, basically healthy people can do a three-day water fast at home. It's a lovely thing to do. Uh, it's like taking your cells to the car wash for three days. You're just running pure water through your cells and you emerge from that lighter and cleaner and it's a lovely, lovely thing to do. And I have patients who do that uh, every other week, twice a month, they'll do a three-day uh, stretch on just water alone. And if you're a healthy person on no medications and no health problems, absolutely everyone can do that. And uh, I said, I have patients Friday morning, they start their water program, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Monday morning, they have some, uh, they have some vegetable juice and or maybe a bowl of soup. And they gradually just uh, over the course of 48 hours increase their, uh, their food con uh, consumption and get back to their healthy diet. So yeah. Yes, uh, people can do three days uh, at home on their own if you're a healthy person. At True North Health Center, we've learned uh, how to bring people out of fasts. And in general, you want to start with the easiest, lightest foods of all. Uh, these are basically uh, vegetable juices. And if a person is healthy, doesn't have diabetes or autoimmune diseases, uh, we can do a fruit-based juice like watermelon celery juice, or we'll give them a bowl of watermelon chunks. But the key is not so much the sugar, it's the water content. You, you want to be on high water content foods. So uh, that's why we do juices, which are all, basically all of this water, uh, or, the, or the watermelon chunks. And you want to gradually increase fiber uh, down into the intestinal tract. 
back. So our standard progression after longer fast uh, is, a, is a day on juices, and then we move on to either soups or steamed vegetables, and then on to raw vegetables, because raw cabbage and carrot fiber can be pretty tough, so I like them after the steamed vegetables. And then finally, uh, uh, oh, I missed a day of fruit there. We do the juices, a day of fruits, uh, then the steamed vegetables, then the, introduce the raw vegetables. These are all added on to each other. And finally, the denser foods, uh, the rice and, and beans and potatoes. Etc. So that's the standard refeed after a longer fast, but a, just 72 hours on water doesn't require that long a reintroduction. So just a day starting it with, uh, uh, with vegetable or fruit juices and uh, some soup in the evening and you're pretty much ready to go back to your healthy plant-based diet at that point. Enemas are not required during a water fast, and especially during these long water fasts. And at the middle or the end of a fast, people get pretty depleted. They don't need to have uh, that added stress added to their system. So we really strongly suggest, almost require, that when people come to our clinic in preparation of doing a fast, at least for the three days before they walk in our front door. They've eaten a diet of only vegetables and fruits. We want only plant material sitting in those intestines because what's ever in those intestines pretty much sits there. And if they've got uh, cheese and fish and white bread and meat sitting in their intestines, now by the end of the fasting period, um, their intestines uh, are pretty plugged up and these are pretty uncomfortable people. So if the only thing coming into the fast that's in their intestines are fruit and vegetable material, there's no real need to take an enema. But many people uh, come to our clinic not having had that preparation, and they are full of white bread and cheese, and they have a salmon sandwich bagel at the, uh, at the airport. And uh, these folks, uh, we often will send them over to the colon hydrotherapist and have her clean out the colon as kind of a deluxe enema. Uh, so they start the uh, program with a, with a clean, empty colon. So for whatever that's worth, I certainly have no objections if people want to do an enema before the fast. Uh, uh, that's probably a good thing to do, but we don't require it in our program. Fasting is an ancient modality, of course, it was described in the Bible. It's been used for thousands of years to you know, quell powerful and inflammatory states of the body. You now, if there was a pill that lowered high blood pressure, cleared out diabetes, quelled migraine headaches, made asthma go away, uh, and, extinguished the fire in hot, painful rheumatoid joints, cleared psoriatic plaques and psoriasis. If there was a pill that did all this, we'd be trillionaires. But a water fast will do all those things. It's that powerful modality. And people bring all those conditions to our clinic. And as a result, uh, over 25 years, we've become quite skilled at managing long water fasts. It's amazing how long the body can go uh, when just drinking water. There are definite stages in that program. And the longest fast we will supervise at True North is 40 days and uh, this and it happens not infrequently and there are people with just intractable high blood pressure just out of control diabetes just inflamed joints that are painful to look at these folks need to do three four five week fast uh, however we are set up to do this uh, at two north we do nutrition based medicine done right uh, everyone who comes in sees an MD physician uh, for initial health assessment. Laboratory tests are ordered. It's decided whether they should do the feeding program, a juice cleanse, or a water fast. And no matter what program they decide, uh, they, are, they live in a nice apartment room there. And our interns uh, knock on the door twice a day, uh, 8 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon their vital signs, their polls, how are you doing? We watch these people like a hawk. And we are constantly monitoring for signs that says their body has reached the point where it's time to break the fast. That somebody is, you know, pounding headaches. They are, they're getting ready to vomit. They are getting so lightheaded when they stand up, they feel like they're gonna pass out. Uh, their pulses get fast. If we detect these signs, then it's time to end the fast. And so because we're experienced at watching this, it's safe, uh, there's no question from a body point of view, to do a 40-day water fast. Again, assuming that you have normal kidney function and the body is otherwise healthy. Now, we supervise up to 40-day fast, but everyone's different. 
the calendar is the largest uh, determinant of when people have to listen, listen to that, they got to leave on the 29th. Well, that defines the parameters of the fast. But just from a biological point of view, the people who come in say, listen, I'm open-ended, I'll stay here as long as I need to. Uh, everyone's different. Some people, a two-week fast works, some people a three or four-week fast, some people five or five-week fast or longer. So uh, it's a clinical judgment based on everybody's individual needs. But uh, people can do 40-day fast and emerge, emerge lighter and leader afterwards. Uh, but they're different metabolic creatures. And if they adopt a whole food plan, plant-based diet from that point on, they usually don't have to come back and do another fast. As far as how frequently one can do a water fast, again, it depends on the person and their state of health going into it. If they're borderline kidney failure, they shouldn't be fasting at all. Uh, if they're basically a healthy person, uh, we're now understanding more of the nuances of fasting. Uh, classically, uh, and any healthy person could do a three-day water fast twice a month, and we have patients who do that. I have patients who fast on Fridays and, or Sundays every week, and that's absolutely reasonable. When you think about it, our digestive system is the only system we never really let rest. You know, when you're sleeping, your muscle system rests, your nervous system rests. But if you have a 10 o'clock snack while you're sleeping, your digestive system still has to be churning away there. And, because food has become a recreational activity in our society, our digestive systems are constantly working. And so any day, one day that you can give your digestive system and your body a break from digesting food is a good thing. So the so-called intermittent fasting, as I said, just one day a week, or people uh, declare a daily fast from when they get up in the morning till noon. They just drink water till noon. And they just extend their nighttime fast to the daytime hours. And there's wonderful benefits in doing that. So again, it depends uh, who the person is and the reason for the fasting. But if they're brief, uh, they can be done, as I said, uh, even one day a week on, on a weekly basis there. But it's a longer fasts, uh, the three-day fast, uh, that you can do twice a month. Five days or longer under supervision. Um, that you can do that three or four times a year, and we have many people who come to True North uh, for exactly that program. Uh, people come to True North for a health vacation. They say, look doc, we can go to Las Vegas and come back fatter, sicker, and poorer, or we can come to True North to a five or seven day water fast and a refeed program and leave lighter and cleaner and healthier with money in our pocket because it's not a very expensive place to stay. And so for that reason, uh, people come all the time for a little touch up fast and uh, they're very happy when they leave. So I, I think it's a modality that's gonna get wider and wider acceptance as, uh, as time goes on. At our clinic at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, we make a distinction between a water fast and a juice cleanse. Because on a water fast, you are drinking only water, there are zero calories in it. And after 48, 72 hours on a water fast, after you burn through the blood sugar circulating in your body and the stored carbohydrates to glycogen in your liver, uh, then you start metabolizing fat tissue. And as you metabolize fat tissue, molecules called ketones come into the bloodstream. And ketones have some interesting properties, one of which they suppress hunger. As God's gift to fasters, you don't spend seven or 14 days hungry. Now, by day three or four, now people, they're not even hungry. You, you see them sitting down in the dining room watching other guests eat. You ask them, are you hungry? Uh, not, even, not even hungry at all. And so uh, the ketones bring that gift of quelling hunger. And uh, there's other uh, benefits that can accrue from being in a the state of ketosis for a short period of time. You don't want to stay in it week after week after week after week, uh, month after month, as uh, some people advocate. Uh, but a short uh, spell of ketosis can help uh, the body shift into a, a gear where inflammation subsides and cancer growth is, uh, is quelled. And so uh, the state of ketosis is a real benefit during water fasting. On a juice cleanse, however, 
We don't say it's a juice fast because it's not really a fast, it's a 600 calorie liquid diet. Um, these juices certainly have uh, glucose and other sugars in them. And as a result, people don't go into ketosis. And so they're on kind of a different metabolic path. But that's not to say a juice cleanse is of no value. It's of great value, especially to most of our clients who, come, who are coming in from cheeseburger and pepperoni pizza land uh, to spend five or seven or ten days with these wonderful vegetable juices flowing through their tissues loaded with phytonutrients uh, and antioxidants and all the wonderful things that are in the fresh plants. We make our juices right on premises there. Oh, it's a healing, cleansing thing to do. And the the benefits that people get from this are quite remarkable. And we see many of the similar changes. The inflammation subsides, uh, their bowels start working better. Uh, so uh, juice cleanse has some wonderful benefits, uh, but it's not the same as a water fast. And we have to decide uh, when to use which because there are some people who, who just should not do a water fast. On a water fast, the action of any medication the person may be taking are potentiated. We, we see a lot more power from these drugs and as a result, the rule is all medications stop on a water fast. And you stop all the beta blockers and blood pressure medications, uh, etc. And the thyroid dosage just cut in half because uh, it's all potentiated. But there are some people who are on medications they can't stop if they're on prednisone or antidepressants. And because of the risk of potentiating these drugs, uh, water fasting is not safe for them. So during the initial uh, intake assessment, uh, that is, point is established. And we tell the person, you're not a suitable candidate for water fasting, but you'd be excellent for a juice cleanse. So we frequently recommend juice cleanses in in those people where water fasting is medically contraindicated. So do a lot of juice cleansing and it's a wonderful, wonderful program. People can certainly do that safely at home and, and I urge that if people are considering it to give it a try. As far as the question of fruit versus vegetable juices, uh, our fruit-based juices uh, have a role. Uh, uh, people have been on a long, you know, two, three, four week fast. Uh, the uh, first juice will often bring them, if they're healthy, they don't have diabetes issues, they don't have inflammatory joint disease, etc. We'll bring them a glass of fresh watermelon juice with a little bit of celery juice in it, and it's ambrosia from the gods. And, uh, and so that's a place where fruit juices have a role. And if a healthy person wants uh, four glasses of juice during their first day, well, well that's just fine. Um, however, fair amount of sugar, and that sugar is absorbed quickly because the fiber is pretty much left behind and you only have the juice. And no other animal you know, throws its fruits into a blender and drinks them. It's not the most natural way to ingest uh, all these powerful fruit juices, uh, all the, the fruit sugars, etc. So I tell my patients, now uh, when that first juice of common, that when, whether it's fruit or vegetable juice, when that juice comes, and we give them a good 16 ounce glass, it's a tall glass of juice. We tell them, do not just bolt that juice right down. And some people believe, oh, it's gonna oxidize, you have to drink it quickly. Well, you certainly don't have that kind of time pressure. Those juices are quite stable for hours. And I tell my patient, look, avoid the, that temptation. There is nothing natural or physiologic about dumping 16 ounces of fruit, sugar, and potassium into your system all at once, especially after you haven't eaten for, for weeks. So I, sell, I tell my patients, uh, whether they've been doing water fasting or just on a juice cleanse, look, when you get that juice, take a mouthful, put the glass down, chew it up, mix it with your saliva, swallow it, wait five minutes. Let that juice get down into your stomach, out into your duodenum, get start being absorbed, and then take another mouthful, put the glass down, chew it up, swallow it, wait five or ten minutes. Take an hour, take two hours to drink each of these juices. Don't, don't flood them down all at once. Uh, and because, to your question, the fruit sugars uh, can, well, certainly put diabetes uh, out of whack. And 
If the person hasn't eaten for a few weeks, the bacteria in their gut, their microbiome, they're very different in organisms than when they walked in. The last thing I want to do is suddenly wake them up, uh, you know, like an alarm clock with 16 ounces of fruit sugar right away. And it's a way to, uh, to rekindle the autoimmune problems, the, the gut problems. So I'm a big fan of green juices largely, the non-sugary ones. Now, though we'll put in a little bit of carrot or apple so it doesn't taste like lawn clippings, but I'm, but I'm a big fan of the green juices. And so we bring them uh, four juices a day, one at nine, one at noon, one at three, and one at five, and drink them slowly as we, we mentioned. And they don't usually get the problems of uh, the sudden uh, floods of fruit sugar into their bloodstream. So for that reason, I'm more of a fan of the, uh, of the vegetable juices, but the, the fruit juices uh, in healthy people do have their place as well. But the fruit juices can be a bit of a laxative and people who are going on a juice cleanse at home and they're just drinking fruit juice day after day after day, boy, their bowels get loose and other problems uh, can arise. So uh, careful with those uh, fruit ju fruit-based juices. Um, I would suggest at least alternating them. Do a, Start with a fruit juice, then go to a, a green vegetable juice, then a fruit juice, then a green vegetable one. That's usually a pretty safe program that we find works. There's a very significant difference between juicing and putting the fruits or vegetables in a blender and basically making a smoothie and consuming that. Uh, with the juicing, and again, if we're talking about a toxic person that uh, is overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, and just lives on fast foods, um, a, a week or two, even a few days, on uh, uh, freshly made vegetable juices, uh, maybe with a little bit of fruit in them, is a, is a wonderful thing to do. But we've come to realize that in the very act of juicing, of course, uh, out comes this lovely colorful juice, but then a whole big pile of vegetable pulp builds up. And we're realizing that in that pulp are most of the good nutrients that were in the fruit. They're bound to the fiber that's left behind. And the juices, though well, they have this wonderful reputation, they look wonderfully colored. Um, truth is, is they've been really uh, diminished in their uh, phytonutrient uh, content. And so uh, don't look at, with contempt at that fiber that's uh, left behind by the juicer. Find some way to throw that into a soup or do something because there's a lot of good things uh, left behind there. And so that is a bit of a deficit with fruit juices. So, well, how about eating that fiber by, instead of putting the um, vegetables or fruits through a juicer, put it into a blender and basically make a smoothie? Well, of course, that's going to be a lot more nutritious, and uh, that would be the better thing to do uh, from a strictly nutritional point of view. But in all honesty, I'm not a big smoothie fan either, uh, because, uh, you know, you would never eat yeah, three bananas, a uh, pineapple, two boxes of berries, uh, uh, an, an apple, uh, a pear, a bunch of grapes, a big handful of kale, and a half pound of spinach. Uh, but boy, you can put all of that into a blender, whiz it up, and bolt it down in 90 seconds on your way out the door and think you've done something good for yourself. But really, well, there's nothing natural or physiologic about dumping all that sugar and water and, and liberated potassium and fiber into your stomach. I, we, do, we did not emerge from our mother's womb clutching a Vitamix, you know, and it's not really a natural thing to do. And um, there's going to be concerns whether that upsets the intestinal flora, whether it uh, promotes loose stools, whether it changes blood chemistry in not desirable ways. And so those are all wonderful foods to eat. Uh, I recommend uh, I think uh, what I'd describe is it's, it's lazy 21st century nutrition. Now, I don't have time to eat, I'm late for the office here, I'm, you know, I'm out the door there. And I say, listen, if it's such an important thing to nourish your body properly, set the alarm clock 25 minutes earlier, get up and eat the, the berries, you know, eat the mango. Uh, eat, the, eat the pineapple chunks, uh, sit down and eat the food, <clears throat> because there's benefits 
in chewing up food, and the food then gets to contact your saliva that has enzymes that it interacts with the mouth bacteria uh, that liberate very important nutrients and increases the absorption of vitamins. There's a reason uh, why nature wants us to uh, to interact uh, our food with our with our mouth chemistry. And when we slide that smoothly to the back of the throat and swallow it, we bypass that very very important step. And so for that reason, I'm a big fan of uh, using those 32 juicers that Mother Nature gave us, 16 in our upper jaw and 16 in our lower jaw. And it's at the class a little earlier, sit down and eat these wonderful foods, chew them up really well, make, you know, juice them in your mouth, and you'll get so much more benefit that uh, your blender can uh, sit quietly in the corner. I, I think you'll be ahead of the game. I've watched with some distress as this paleo fad has swept through the media and many people have jumped on it because ooh, they like that taste of meat in their mouth and as my friend Dr. John McDougall says, people love to hear good news about bad habits and oh that's what the paleo folks ate, that's, that was the most healthy natural diet, that's what we all would be eating like every, like every caveman had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat. I'm a, I'm a caveman, I eat meat, that's what I do. And so it's a high flesh-based type of eating style. Well, first of all, it's not historically true. Uh, when they examine uh, the fossilized fecal droppings from the, from the uh, paleo camps there, it uh, turns out they, that we were eating huge amounts of fiber, much more than we are today, and most of the calories brought into the ancient paleolithic camps were gathered by the women who spent all day pulling up starchy roots and tubers and wild legumes and wild grasses and harvesting nuts and acorns and berries. Uh, we were largely starchivores. We, uh, that's what got us through the winter seasons. And to think that there was flesh all the time uh, is simply not true. Most hunts were unsuccessful. Uh, if they did bring back a carcass, it rotted quickly. Um, meat was a relative rarity uh, in the diet rather than the that being so bountiful as, uh, as the paleo mythos would have us believe. But history aside, uh, we have this lovely long digestive system, su superbly uh, engineered to digest plant materials. And when you think, if you believe in evolution at all, you know, before the paleo era 10,000 years ago, for the two million years before that, we and, and the simian ancestors who evolved with us spent all day eating leaves and berries and fruits uh, as they still do. To think that suddenly 10,000 years ago we suddenly became the carnivorous ape, well our dentition does not uh, support that. Uh, people say, oh we got these canine teeth, so you were supposed to be eating meat. But if you look in the mirror, and, you know, open your mouth in the bathroom, look in the mirror, you'll find your canine teeth are shorter your canines on the side here, these pointy ones, are shorter than your central incisors. Go look at your house cat and then your dog. You'll see true canine teeth. They're much longer. And those are flesh-tearing teeth. Well, ours are meant for uh, biting into apples and, and potatoes. It works good for that. But we don't, from, the, from top to the bottom, this is not a flesh-digesting uh, system by a long shot. And from a medical point of view, I think the folks eating of this flesh-based diet are opening the door to a host of diseases. If someone asks me, Doc, I want to cause a colon cancer, how can I do that? I'd say, simple. You pack your colon full of meat three times a day, let that rub on your colon for 20, 30 years. Watch what you set off in there. There's no accident that uh, people who eat flesh-based diets have a lot more colon cancer uh, than, the, than the plant eaters. <clears throat> the, um, uh, the food we eat determines the bacteria that live in your gut. You eat sugar-eating foods, you're gonna summon up sugar-eating bacteria. Well, you drop animal flesh down your gut two, three times a day, you're gonna summon up bacteria like Clostridia and Peptostreptococci that love to eat carnitine, a major constituent of animal muscle. Well, <clears throat> the next time that chicken breast, that salmon steak, that beef filet comes down, those bacteria who you've summoned up through this diet they can't wait for it to get their hands on that carnitine and creatine because they don't care about you. They're going to turn that carnitine and creatine into stuff called trimethylamine, which your 
liver will turn into trimethylamine oxide. This is a molecule from hell. This drives cholesterol into the artery walls and is a major factor in atherosclerosis, it leads to heart attacks and strokes. And I've heard already stories about uh, guys on paleo diets dropping dead on the treadmill at 49. Oh, he looked so healthy, but inside he was an old, old man. Uh, these bacteria that, that come and meet, um, they generate stuff called endotoxin, that makes your gut leaky and allows proteins uh, to leak out in your bloodstream, flow through your tissue, sets off autoimmune diseases. And so though there's this whole mythos about the paleo diet being natural, the truth is from a medical point of view, I fear these friends and colleagues and patients of mine are setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer, heart attacks, strokes, autoimmune disease, gastrointestinal inflammatory bowel disease. I think this is a diet of death uh, uh, from, a, from the medical personal point of view, certainly a diet of death from the animal points of view, and it contributes to the slaughter of 70 billion animals on this planet every year. But this diet, if everybody adopts, is going to kill this planet. There's no possible way that you can serve animal flesh three times day to nine billion people. It's going to destroy everything that supports life on this planet. So from top to bottom, what it does to the people, what it does to the animals, what it does to the planet, it's an unsustainable, deadly diet. And, and for this reason, I, I think we were designed to eat plants, and that, I think, uh, should be the major constituent of our diet without question. I did much of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in Wisconsin. And it's very clear that the purpose of cow's milk is to turn a 65-pound calf into a 700-pound cow as rapidly as possible. And cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. That's what the stuff is. Everything in that white liquid, the hormones, the lipids, the sodium, the protein, the growth factors, IGF-1, everything is in there to blow that calf up into a great big cow or it wouldn't be there. And whether you pour it on your cereal as a liquid, whether you turn it into butter, whether you coagulate it into yogurt, whether you ferment it into cheese, whether you freeze it into ice cream, it's baby calf growth fluid. If you're trying to lose weight, that seems to be counterproductive to saying the least. But there's some scary things in cow's milk. The dairy industry didn't let us know that they've changed their practices. On my uncle's farm, when a cow would come into her pregnant uh, cycle, uh, her fertility cycle, we would lock her up in the stanchion, the man from Badger Breeders would come and, and ram that tube of bull semen up to her uterus and make her pregnant. And shortly after there, she would stop lactating. She'd stop giving milk. Uh, pregnant mammals uh, stop lactating for good reason. Uh, and and uh, she'd be off the production line for months at a time so she had her next baby and then would uh, start giving milk again. Well, that worked for my uncle's dairy farm with 40 cows back in the 1950s. In today's modern dairy operations with 2,000, 3,000 cows, the, the dairy producer cannot afford to have their best milkers taken offline for months at a time. So they have genetically modified the cows, so now they will give milk even though they're pregnant with their next calf. They give milk all the way through their pregnancy. So every dish of ice cream, every container of Greek yogurt, every slice of mozzarella cheese on your pizza these days is, with rare exceptions, made from the milk of large pregnant bovines. The estrogen content of this milk is through the roof. This All pregnant female mammals have estrogen coursing through all their tissues. And this milk is loaded with estrogens. And, and when people consume it, it shows up in their, in their urine within 15 minutes. Their urine is pouring with estrone, estradiol, estriol, pregnandiol, progesterone. These are potent mammalian estrogens. These are not the puny little phytoestrogens in soy. These are official mammalian estrogens. And doctors are getting concerned about this. Why are our little girls going through puberty at age eight and nine and 10? Because they have something to do with that river of milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt they are pouring down their gullet every day, filled with powerful cow estrogens. Get your mammograms, ladies. Why do American women get breast lumps? It's not normal, it's not natural. If you go to rural China, you don't see women with breast lumps yet. When the American diet metastasizes over there, you will. <laughs> um, 
uh, maybe has something to do with all the milk and cheese and ice cream yogurt they're eating for, to prevent osteoporosis, which it doesn't do. <clears throat> now, we get most more osteoporosis than anyone else on the planet, though we consume more calcium and dairy products than anyone. Guys look down and say, hey, where I got these man boots, you know? He's sitting there eating his cheese nachos and his deep dish pizza. Fella, you're eating cow estrogens. What do you think is going to happen? And every hundredth case of breast cancer is in a man. Uh, could have that have something to do with all this cheese that they're eating. You know, estrogens make the prostate gland unstable. The guys get more prostate cancer when they eat dairy products. And when a woman gets a breast cancer and she's eating baby calf growth fluid laced with, with these growth hormones, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. Their, their cancers grow faster, they die, or they die faster, nastier deaths. So when you ask what's wrong with dairy products, good heavens. Um, I tell my patients, look in the mirror. If you got big ears and a tail, if you're a baby calf, cool, you know, and enjoy your dairy products. But if you're not a baby calf, there's so much else to pour on your cereal these days. They all need lovely almond milks and rice milks and hemp milks. Use some, some of these non-dairy substitutes and uh, I think you're going to be far healthier as a result. Fish has a reputation, oh, with health food, it's got omega-3 fats in it, some brain food, good for you. But two major problems with that. We've been treating our oceans like a sewer, and now all these fish uh, in the ocean, and especially the big predator fish that feel, uh, feed on the smaller fish, I have accumulated so much mercury and so many pesticides that you have to view virtually all fish flesh as toxic these days uh, from the medical point of view. Um, and we are hauling two trillion animals out of the ocean every single year. Uh, I urge all the viewers uh, to get and read uh, the wonderful book by Dr. Richard Oppenlander called Comfortably Unaware. And he lays out what our flesh-based and fish-based diets are doing to this planet. And, uh, and the story of the oceans is so tragic. And it, there is no sustainable fishery any longer. We're strip mining the oceans. We're clear cutting the oceans. We're, uh, we're, leaving, we're gonna leave an ocean full of jellyfish to our kids. Um, so, uh, f from the toxic point of view, from the ecologic point of view, it, it's time to stop eating the fish. There are plenty, you get plenty of protein out of beans and peas and chickpeas and hummus sandwiches and you know, lentil stews. There's, pl there's plenty of protein around. But how about those omega-3s that you know, you know, we get from the fish, from the fish oil? Well, surprise, surprise. Fish do not make omega-3 fatty acids. They don't make DHA. They don't make EPA. Well, where does it come from? Those essential omega-3 fatty acids are made by plants. They're made by algae cells that float in the ocean. And fish swim in the ocean with their mouths open all day, swallowing the algae. And it's the algae DHA that winds up in the fish's muscle that when you kill the fish and crush the flesh and get ooh, fish oil, it's algal, algae-derived DHA that you're really eating. Well, guess what? Uh, some smart entrepreneurs realize that we're running out of fish and the DHA, essential fatty acids, come from algae in the first place. So they are growing these lovely omega-3 producing fatty, fatty, uh, fatty acid producing algae in big tanks of pure seawater or clean seawater. And they're harvesting um, the algae and extracting the DHA directly from the algae. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, it's time to leave the fish off the hook. And and so if you want extra DHA or EPA, then absolutely reasonable, go to your uh, health food store or online and look for algae-derived DHA or EPA and uh, take one or two veggie caps of that every day and you'll get all the benefits of that without having to uh, kill any of these magnificent fish and, and, and increasingly fewer of them left. So for all the way around, again, time to leave the fish off the hook, uh, eat plants and take a little extra algae-derived DHA if you'd like. Oh, chicken and turkey and poultry dishes uh, have that reputation. Oh, it's, it's, it's healthier. The, it's white meat. Ooh, light meat. And uh, it's got this reputation, which in truth is completely undeserved. Uh, let's call things for what they are. 
uh, even the cage-free, free-range chickens there, there are, these poor birds are raised in these vast warehouses, 100,000, 200,000 turkeys or chickens in this large football field size enclosure. That, uh, the cage-free, you boys, uh, the chickens are having a wonderful time. They're not. And they get these uh, terrible diseases that shoot through the whole flock. You've got to feed them antibiotics and try and prevent that. But very importantly, these are not your grandmother's chickens. These are not your grandfather's turkeys. <clears throat> these birds have been genetically bred and modified um, to put on weight as fast as possible. The more these birds weigh when they have their throats cut at slaughter, the more that chicken flesh producer makes. And so these birds are bred to put on fat as, as quickly as possible. You know, the advertisers, ooh, melt in your mouth, ooh, that wonderful, uh, delicious, juicy uh, chicken and turkey. Why is that flesh melt in your mouth juicy? Because of all the fat in it. <clears throat> and if you need a visual image, remember the last time you watched someone make chicken soup? And what floats up to the top, a layer of fat comes out of that chicken flesh. And people eating this flood their system with these saturated fats that injure their artery walls, that uh, uh, set them up for atherosclerosis and all sorts of problems. Uh, uh, this, this ridiculous idea, oh, saturated fats are good for you now. No, they're not. Uh, to, uh, the one study that they seized on that showed uh, that, that there may not be a problem with saturated fats was flawed. It's been dis, uh, uh, discarded by all reputable sciences now, but it hit the news and it stuck. Ooh, saturated fats are good for you. They're not. Now, small amounts from avocados, okay. Uh, but to think that eating this fatty chicken flesh, etc., or turkey flesh is good for you, is certainly not. And also, all these worrisome contaminating substances that are fed to the animals. They, they feed these animals, these birds, antibiotics. They feed them grains sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. These are fat-soluble substances, and they're in that fat that people are eating with that chicken breast and that drumstick. And so the truth is, even though chicken flesh and turkey flesh has this reputation with late healthy meat, the truth is, it's the most unhealthy of all the flesh foods. And it's, and it's filled with substances that really cause you damage. And so uh, I would urge people to see beyond the advertising uh, ploys that are put out in the, uh, in the media and uh, see that there's nothing healthy about eating birds, uh, especially the way they're raised today. And that's another idea that should exit the stage left. We've used up the chicken and turkey, uh, and we've used up flesh eating in general. It no longer serves us. It's time for a major evolution on this whole planet to plant-based uh, diets while we still have the time to do that. And chicken and turkeys need to uh, go back to the forest of Asia where they came from. And uh, at least the chickens, the turkeys, or American birds, let them, go, let them do what they used to do out in the wild there, but time to stop eating those birds. Eggs are often a negotiation point between me and my patients. They, they get the flesh thing, they get the dairy thing. Well, how about eggs, Doc? Uh, but the truth is, uh, I wouldn't put them on the healthy list by a long shot. The, the yolk of a hen's egg is the most concentrated glom of fat and cholesterol on the planet. It's made to run a baby chicken for 21 days with no outside energy. It is pure fat that floods through your system, uh, not doing great things for your arteries or your inflammatory states. And the white um, um, has a lot of molecules called choline in it, and choline um, will spawn bacteria down your gut that will turn that choline into stuff called trimethylamine with the help of your liver. That drives cholesterol into your artery walls. Um, there's nothing I can see that's healthy about eggs. I haven't eaten them for 35 years and, and suffered no, uh, no health deficit from them. Um, that said, um, will one egg once a week uh, make lightning come out of the sky and strike you dead? Probably not, but don't think that you're doing anything healthy for yourself. And, and I would say, uh, time to leave the eggs behind. And, and that individual egg there, who knows the, the pesticide content in the yolks there? Who knows uh, what's really going to be spawned in your gut as a result? Um, I, it's a survival food, you know, that, that got our ancient 
and their ancestors through times of famine when they would raid the bird's nests, but it should be left in the dim past. I wouldn't call eggs a health food by a long shot. Oh, beef, uh, it's for what's, what's for dinner. It's what's for dinner if you want to wind up dead and have your children faced with a hot, bleak, dying planet, beef's uh, really good for it. But uh, the truth is, uh, from a medical point of view, as has become well known, um, the, the fat and cholesterol damages the arteries. And paleo folks uh, uh, have a hard time accepting it, but the, the truth is it, it certainly does. Um, the, um, the protein is, can be damaging to the liver and the kidneys. But from an ecological point of view, there's no animal on the planet, prized as it is, from around the world, from Africa to the American West, uh, IR beef, <clears throat> but they are four-legged environment and future-destroying machines. Uh, every um, uh, bovine, every cow, a steer, uh, uh, drinks 50 gallons of water a day. Um, the grains that are used to feed these animals um, takes up the majority of water used in America today. People are facing water shortages across the country and around the world. Most Americans, 70% of all the water in, in the continental United States goes to irrigate alfalfa or grow corn and soybeans uh, that are poured down the gullet. Um, beef animals uh, to make cheap cheeseburgers. Uh, these burgers that sell for two dollars each, those are government subsidized. They, gov they subsidize the grain farmers, the soybean farmers. If those burgers really sold for what it really costs to produce them, if the beef producers really had to pay for the water and pay to clean up the streams and, and the rivers and pay to mitigate all the greenhouse gases, these animals belch methane, um, they uh, uh, breathe out carbon dioxide, the fertilizers spread in those corn and soybean fields release nitrous oxide. These are the three most powerful greenhouse gases uh, uh, known to science and are beef consumption, our beef production consumption is driving all of them. If, if those costs were factored into the burger and you stopped the, the government subsidies for the grains, these burgers would cost $100 a piece and you would only eat them twice a year and that would be a far more reasonable uh, uh, schedule to eat them on. Uh, on every level, um, beef is the, is the, uh, the hummer of, uh, of, of Western nutrition. And I would urge viewers, please get and read the magnificent book by Dr. Richard Oppenlander called Comfortably Unaware. And he will lay out exactly uh, the problem with beef and all of, of animal agriculture, but, but of all the problems that uh, animal agriculture creates. Uh, the beef is the, is the uh, hood ornament uh, because it, uh, it's the most egregious uh, of all the environmental transgressors that, uh, that we produce. Inevitably, when talking about beef, the issue, well, how about grass-fed beef? Ooh, that's, a, that's m more ecologically sustainable and I don't have to use the feedlots. Truth is, the grass-fed animals contribute more damage to the global warming problem because the cows in the feedlot are only there for, for at the most, 14 months. But, and so they certainly put out lots of methane and carbon dioxide. But to get a... Uh, beef animal uh, who is out on the grasslands uh, big enough to market, they've got to be out there two, two and a half, three years. Well, that's an extra year and a half of walking around, belching out methane, breathing out carbon dioxide, tramping down the streams and the, uh, or polluting the streams, tramping down the soils. Um, they're the worst of the ecological menaces that we face. So don't think you're doing something good for either your body or the planet by eating grass-fed, rain-fed beef there. Uh, again, more marketing, but as far as the planet goes, uh, it's certainly not a healthy food environment by any stretch. My eating habits have become progressively simpler as the years have gone on. I find such flavor 
in fresh vegetables. There's always, at lunch and dinner, a big colorful salad. And I emphasize colorful, dark green romaine lettuce and yellow carrots and, and red peppers and tomatoes and radishes and jicama and every fresh vegetable we can put in there. You've got to have fresh live foods every day. You can't be healthy even as a vegan if you're living on uh, granola bars and energy drinks. You need the fresh live food every day. So please, uh, I have an urge and everyone watching, now have a big salad at least once a day, if not twice a day, lunch and dinner. So a big salad is always there. I'm a wonderful fan of soups and uh, my wife, Elise, makes great soup. So now she's making a little big batch of hearty vegetable soup or chili or curry and we'll eat off of that for three days uh, in, in the refrigerator there. So salads and soups are mainstays. Always have a healthy starch, whether it's potatoes or quinoa or buckwheat. Now uh, there's usually a healthy starch on the plate. And uh, I'm a big fan of something leguminous, something from the legume family, beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, because they're so rich in protein. So there's always a scoop of lentil stew or a healthy bean taco uh, without using the, the flour, probably use lettuce boats instead, and a uh, uh, bean chili. Uh, we find some ways to get legumes into most every meal. So, uh, and uh, because of all the vegetables, uh, dark greens are the most important. Uh, there's always some steamed kale, broccoli, chard, Brussels sprouts, something dark and green. So the four S's, uh, soup, salad, steamed greens, and healthy starches, those are the, the pillars of every lunch and dinner that I have. And uh, it's what I recommend for my patients, and uh, you can make them absolutely delicious. They're filling, and it never crosses my mind to go out and have a cheeseburger when I've got a meal like that waiting at home. Our medical system now spends two trillion dollars, I think, uh, on health care, but the truth is it's disease care. And because doctors are so afraid of getting sued if they miss a cancer or they miss an impending stroke or whatever, testing has become a multi-billion dollar industry. And People are encouraged to get a battery of tests every year, blood tests, check your lipids and your liver function, and et cetera, et cetera. Have a colonoscopy. If you're a woman, have a mammography. Boy, they're looking, looking for early disease. Prevention, better than treatment. But this is not prevention. This is early detection of disease that's already there. And, and all of this comes back to that plaque that I have in my office. Well, what diseases are they looking for? Clogged arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, inflammatory diseases, and cancers. All of these are driven by our current uh, animal-based, meat and dairy uh, rich, uh, processed, sugar-laden, oil-laden um, 21st century diet. Uh, my, the plaque in my office says it's the food. <laughs> it's been the food all along. And, and it's so sad and alarming to me for us to spend these billions and billions of dollars looking for signs of diseases that we're creating every day with every burger and, and bean, you know, bean, you know, beef taco and, and pepperoni pizza. That's the cause of these diseases. That's what clogs the arteries and raises the blood pressure and clogs the insulin receptors so we get diabetes and then sets off inflammatory bowel disease. It's the food, it's the food, it's the food. And so we've got this cycle that feeds on itself. Uh, the food, God forbid, the doctor should ask the patients, what are you eating? And recommend a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, that would change everything. But oh yeah, that's the, you know, the name with which they're not bespoken. You know, they don't talk to the patient about their diet. Because it means the doctor's got to change his own diet and he doesn't want to do that. And so uh, we get this uh, never-ending, repeating cycle of bad food creating bad diseases, so you spend these trillions of dollars trying to reverse diseases that the person is perpetuating with, with, every, with every pizza. And so if you're eating that standard American diet, yeah, you probably should get your lipids checked and blood count, your liver function, kidney function, you know, test for cancer, colonoscopies. But if you are eating a whole food plant-based diet, and you are lean and healthy with normal blood pressure, normal bowel function. Uh, I've had no medical problem for years and years, and every meal is based on soups and salads and greens and legumes, etc., that I've laid out. You don't need to go to your doctor's office and, uh, and look for diseases that you obviously don't have. Now, a lot depends on your family history. If you're 
My father, two brothers, and uncle all died of colon cancer at age 50. Yeah, you you're clearly have a genetic risk there. And if you're eating a standard meat and dairy-based diet, you ought to get your colonoscopy done. But even with that history, if you've been on a whole food plant-based diet for decades, you've never had any you know, problem, blood in the stool or whatever, get one colonoscopy, maybe another one three years later. And if they are just stone cold negative form, showing no signs of any, um, any polyps or anything, I don't think you need to get another one. And so again, it depends on what you're eating and how you're living your life. And that would let us disengage from the medical system on an individual basis. And on the larger level, Think of the hundreds of billions of dollars we would save on scans not done, on operations not performed, on ICU beds not occupied. It would free up billions and billions of dollars that we could use to fix the roads and send our kids to college and pay off student debt and put internet in everybody's house and, and clean up the rivers and replant the forests. We could do so much else with that money. Now, except pouring it down this black rat hole that we are creating, black hole, this rat hole, this black hole that we're creating with this fast food diet that we're eating. So let's clean up the food and the necessity for these tests will really, really diminish to just the people who need them in a high risk or are showing symptoms. So uh, eat a whole food plant-based diet, you know, stay out of the clutches of people like me. At the clinic at which I work, True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, people bring in a wide variety of conditions. And many of them we will put on a water fast, and we see amazing remission of symptoms. On a water fast, nobody I've seen in eight years gets migraine headaches. Asthma goes away. We're, um, people come in practicing asthmatics, using their inhalers. On a water fast, by day eight, 10, their lungs are clear. And the fact that this happens, that those migraines go away and that asthma clears, said there's a huge component having to do with their food. And what they're eating circulates through the, the arteries servicing their brains and, and can bring out these migraine headaches. Um, and dairy protein especially uh, flows through the bronchial membranes and sets off asthma. And so with all our patients, we use the fast to control the symptoms, but the most important thing is what they eat after the fast. And if they run a whole food plant-based diet through their intestinal system, through their body, day after day, month after month, their intestinal bacteria change, their blood chemistry changes, and often that's the end of their migraines, that's the end of their asthma, uh, and certainly blood, high blood pressure, diabetes. So all of these have their origins in, in the, the current pathogenic diet we have based on meat and dairy and oils and sugars and everything the American diet has devolved into. And um, so we can talk about the individual diseases, but first start with your diet. That's the one thing you can change. You can't change your genetics. You may not be able to change things out in your environment there, but you can sure change what you're putting in your mouth every day run a whole food plant-based diet through your intestinal tract that will change your gut bacteria, that will change your blood chemistry. Those things alone often are all that's needed to make these dreadful life damaging uh, uh, medical issues. You have migraine headaches every three days, uh, asthma so bad you can't walk upstairs up using an inhaler. These things cripple your life. Um, start with the food and clean that up. And then you can uh, call us. We do phone consultations, Skype consultations. We can help you with the, with the fine tuning there. But most of these have their origin in our current uh, Western diet. And if, if that's changed, most of these conditions get better. So start with the food and uh, make it things that grow out of the ground. And there's a good chance that you'll be saying, oh, yeah, I used to have migraines years ago. Oh, I used to have asthma. You know, we hear that all the time. And those are words that people would love to be able to say when they're still uh, in the throes of those diseases. But these conditions can go away and you know, start with the food. And most everything gets better from there.